This lecture will cover Toxocara canis and cat eye, the dog and cat ascaris worms, and Trichinella spiralis, the trichinosis worm. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The objectives for talking about Toxocara and Trichinella are so that you understand the fundamentals of their life cycles, so you can break those cycles, and of course, appreciate their epidemiology. Be able to make this diagnosis and understand that you could get fooled by the differential diagnosis if you don't keep these worms in mind. I'll show you how to make the diagnosis based on testing and make you familiar with treatment options. So here we are on the tree of life. We're still in the nematode section. Toxocara and trichinella are roundworms. Specifically, they're part of the greater family of worms called tissue nematodes. And please be uh, warned, the names can be confusing. Toxocara, not the same as toxoplasma. We're talking about toxocara, which is a roundworm. Toxoplasma gondii, a single-celled parasite, that can infect the brain and other organs of patients. They both come from animals, and so it sounds confusing. I think the root toxo comes from damage. They are both damaging parasites. Similarly, trichinella, not the same as trichomonas. Trichinella is a spiral worm that gets into your meat if you eat undercooked carnivore meat. Trichomonas, single-celled organism uh, that can get into the female reproductive tract, sometimes male reproductive tract. Uh, again, the name trich, I think, comes from hair or thread-like. You can see why in the case of Trichomonas, in the case of Trichinella, it's because the babies look sort of thin and thread-like under the microscope. Let's start with Toxocara canis. The life cycle starts with puppies. Aren't they cute? Well, it turns out that they're not so cute because they're filled with worms, giant worms that look almost identical to human Ascaris, the round worm. And just like in humans, what do these worms do? They have sex and lay eggs. And those eggs make their way in the dog poop into the soil, where they will, over a period of days, embryonate and mature and become infectious. And the natural life cycle is that who comes along next? Another dog. And just like in human Ascaris, inside the dog, the egg is eaten, makes its way into the intestines where it will hatch, turn into a larva. The larva gets into the bloodstream, gets swept up into the lungs. It will molt one or two times and then get coughed up and swallowed back down the esophagus until it matures in the intestines into an adult worm. Boy meets girl, they have sex, they reproduce, eggs come out in the dog poop, they make their way back to the soil and eventually embryonate and mature and become infectious. Now, that's animal veterinary medicine. In human medicine, the story is as you would expect. What if a person comes along instead of a dog and eats the dog poop? Well, the human eats the egg, it gets swallowed and into the intestines, but that's where things change because these worms have evolved for dogs, not humans, and that means that they cannot really reach full maturity inside the human being. Instead, what they do is they wander around looking for their next phase of life, looking for a dog lung. They go through our liver and our spleen and just about any other visceral organ, or they go to our eyeballs and go through our eyes trying to find the lung of a dog. They don't find it, but along the way, of course, they will elicit a significant inflammatory response. If they go through your guts, we call that visceral larva migraines, and if they go through your eyes, we call it ocular larva migraines. So this is a zoonosis. It's very closely related to human ascaris. Hopefully we are dead end hosts because the adult worms can never form and reproduce. Uh, the disease is due to larval migration in our viscera and our eyes. And if you are a cat lover and not a dog lover, yep, there's another worm called Toxicara cat eye, and it's basically the same exact thing. Cats, less clean than they want you to think they are. Now, where does this show up? Any place on planet Earth where people eat dog poop or cat poop. And that's usually young kids because they're playing in a sandbox or eating dirt like normal kids are supposed to do. In the United States, it's about 15% of all American kids who are seropositive. But in other countries in the tropics where there's less sanitation, such as Brazil and Indonesia, seropositivity rates are as high as 40%. 40% of all people in Brazil or Indonesia have had this infection. Now, what does the infection do? So, visceral larva migraines is usually very young kids who eat a lot of dirt or sand, and the larvae, as they migrate through the body, will attract a significant inflammatory response. It's IgE-mediated. It recruits eosinophils to the location of the worm, trying to wall off and form a eosinophilic granuloma around that larva. And that means that kids can present with fever, rash, uh, tender, big liver, or hepatomegaly. They can have swollen lymph nodes. That's called lymphadenopathy. If you look in their lungs, they may have a cough. They may have a wheeze. They may have eosinophilic pneumonia. If it gets into the brain, it can cause headache. If it gets into the brain, it can also cause meningitis, swelling of the meninges, inflammation, encephalitis, swelling of the brain, or 
both meningo and cephalitis. These are nonspecific findings. In medical terms, we call them protein manifestations because they are so changeable. And that means that they're easily misdiagnosed as, a, as an influenza-like illness, for example. It really is serology, blood testing, or even better, seeing the larva on the biopsy of the affected organ that will confirm your diagnosis. Unless you think about this worm, you may misattribute it to a different process. That's visceral larva migraines. What about ocular larva migraines? We don't know why. They tend to be slightly older kids who get this, usually uh, eight, age 8, 9, or 10. They usually have not had visceral larva migraines. They have worms that go to their eyes. And in the eye, granulomas will form. Granulomas cause scar. Scar causes traction, physical pulling on the vitreal uh, humor. And it can also cause scarring to the retina. This obviously can lead to permanent catastrophic blindness unless the children are diagnosed and treated promptly. How does this show up in your practice? Loss of the red reflex. So if you take a flashlight and shine it on somebody's eyes, you should see a nice red eye shining back at you. What, just what you do not want to see if you're taking a digital photograph, right? Well, that's a normal human finding. And if instead we see a white eyeball shine back, that's called leukocoria. And it's very abnormal and it tells you that there's an inflammatory process with scarring at the back of the eye. And this is exactly how eyeball tumors in particular, retinoblastoma may show up. It's the astute ophthalmologist who will recognize that this is not necessarily cancer. It may actually be a worm infection. Check a blood test to do serology, or look in the eyeball and see that larva as it cruises along the back of the vitreous towards the retina. Let's change gears for a moment to a different worm called Trichinella spiralis. It's a different worm, but it has some similar features. You get Trichinella not by eating dog poop, but by eating hog flesh or the flesh of other carnivores that is undercooked. Inside the meat of those carnivores there are small cysts. Each cyst contains the curly Q shaped worm, a larval worm that is trying to get into your system. If you swallow this, of course, the cyst makes its way into your stomach. Stomach acid digests the hunk of meat that you've had. Out come uh, the larval worms, females a little bit bigger than males. The bottom line is they get swept into your duodenum. They meet each other, they have sex, and the females will then stick their tails right into the wall of the duodenum. Unlike Toxocara in Trichinella, they don't lay eggs, they have babies. Live, swiggly, hair-like worms that are babies that get into the wall of the duodenum and then get swept up into the bloodstream. When they do that, those microscopic larval worms will be swept throughout the entire body. They can truly disseminate across any anatomic boundaries they want. They're really trying to get to your muscles so that someone else will eat your flesh and perpetuate the life cycle, but they are perfectly happy to go to the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, even across the blood-brain barrier. What they're trying to do, of course, is become dormant and create new cysts, which will then eventually be eaten by the next carnivore to consume your carcass. If they're not consumed in time, they simply calcify and scar and die. Now in nature, this happens of course when pigs die and their guts and meat are consumed by other carnivores, rats or pigs or bears or badgers or seals or anything else that'll eat a dead pig, and the, which in, by the way includes other pigs. When those carnivores die or are consumed by another pig or other carnivore, the life cycle is perpetuated. All you need to have the life cycle, of course, are two carnivores eating each other's carcasses. So this is a zoonosis. We share it with pigs and other carnivores. Humans are the dead-end hosts, I certainly hope. Unless you die and a pig eats your carcass, you will be a dead-end carnivore. And the disease happens when those tiny larvae migrate throughout your body. This happens every place on planet Earth where people are eating undercooked carnivores, okay? So in the United States, it's typically an infection of hunters who will have a, a wild boar for dinner or make wild boar sausage. So if you are at a party and someone offers you homemade cougar jerky or a raccoon dog or a bear burger, don't, don't do that. Why would you shoot these animals and then eat them? But people do. If you're looking for an excuse not to eat them, you tell them I told you they could catch trichinosis by, by doing that. So how's it going to present clinically? You know, just like with the other worm we talked about a moment ago, Toxicara, in this case, larvae will attract an inflammatory response. It's primarily an IgE-mediated response which will recruit eosinophils to the area to try to wall off and form granulomas around these larvae. Now because the worms can cross anatomic boundary, it, the, uh, the infection can show up in a variety of different ways. Patients will present with fever, they can have a rash on their skin, big tender liver or spleen, lymph nodes that are enlarged, headache. Muscle pain is probably the most important uh, clinical finding because so many of these uh, larvae will try to insist in the skeletal muscle, and that causes myalgia, or muscle pain. 
it can certainly go to the brain and the spinal cord. In severe cases, these patients will become comatose and eventually die. So I want you to think about this in terms of the dissemination of uh, larvae throughout the body. What that means is that this is a nonspecific finding, again, protein, so easily misdiagnosed as an influenza-like illness uh, or any other nonspecific finding. You need to think about trichinosis, get the history of eating a carnivore, send a blood test, that's serology, or even better, do a biopsy of the muscle, a thigh muscle, biceps, or triceps muscle. Just squash it down under a cover slip in the lab. If you see these spiral cysts, you've made a diagnosis. You don't even need to wait for the serology to come back. So I've presented Toxicara and Trichinella together because they are both tissue-invasive roundworms adapted for other animals that have accidentally made their way into humans. And that means that the treatment is very similar. In the case of mild visceral infection with either of these worms, you don't have to do anything. If it's just a few worms and a little fever and a little hepatomegaly, give them supportive care, observe them, and don't do anything specific. But in severe cases of visceral disease or any case of ocular disease, we want to kill those worms using albendazole, and we want to tamp down the overly robust immunologic response using corticosteroids such as prednisone. So important to try to reverse and reduce the destructive response of your own body. In terms of breaking the cycle, in toxocariasis, we should scoop up puppy poop. In fact, you can actually deworm those dogs, get rid of the worms so that they don't put more eggs into the environment, and try to teach kids to wash their hands after they've handled puppy poop. In Trichinella, you know, we should have a system to inspect the meat. For God's sakes, if you're going to have something, especially homemade, make sure that it is thoroughly cooked so that the cysts have been inactivated before you enjoy that cougar liver, whatever it is you're eating. So those are the key concepts. Key concepts for toxicoriasis. These are tissue nematodes that you catch from dog or cat feces by mouth, just like Ascaris, but they cannot mature to their full form. It happens every place where there are people, especially kids eating puppy poop or kitten poop, and the clinical disease happens as those larvae migrate through your tissue. This can cause either visceral larva migraines or ocular larva migraines. So important because it can mimic eye cancer. In the case of eye cancer, the eye may have to be removed. In the case of ocular larva migraines, we can usually treat medically and save that eyeball. We make a diagnosis in patients with a high eosinophil level and with larvae in their tissue. We treat patients with mild disease just with support, but with severe visceral disease, or ocular disease, we give them both an anti-helminthic and an anti-inflammatory. We prevent this by improving sanitation and deworming the dogs. In trichinella, you don't catch it by eating poop, you catch it by eating undercooked carnivore meat. And these viviparous worms will then lay, uh, not eggs, but actually give birth to little larvae that disseminate throughout your system and insist in your body. Happens every place where people eat carnivores in the U.S., they're almost always hunters eating what they kill. It'll present with fever, a flu-like illness, muscle pain, and high eosinophil levels as well. You'll make a diagnosis looking at the eosinophils, do a muscle biopsy or a blood test. And, you know, in mild cases we support them, but in bad cases, just like before, albendazole and corticosteroids. We prevent this by inspecting the meat, and for God's sakes, if in doubt, make sure the meat is thoroughly cooked. Thank you so much for your attention.